Okay, okay, eight seven on the uniform. We're gonna be laying all kinds of heat in there for a few minutes, so we'll try another pickup in a second. And go seven three, you copy Bill two three. Sandy eight, Sandy seven on the uniform. Sandy eight, go. Okay, uh did you talk to Charlie Horse? Sure did. Okay, what did he say about the ground fire? Okay, uh, stand by again. Uh, I told him the jellies took a lot of it from his northwest, and we were going to lay some hay in and try again. Uh, let me get a position from him. Uh, Roger. It looks like that clump of trees probably uh, to his uh, northwest. have a special story or a special connection. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how the two of you met? Well, his nephew, is that right, Steve Moore? Yes. Uh, was, doing, was doing research on his, uh, his uh, military history. And uh, he had called my, I was trying to find out his story. You want to continue with that? Well, I was, uh, I was with a uh, special operations uh, group uh, team and a team leader, and uh, I was assigned to go in uh, to uh, what we call a bright light mission. It was to go in to, to do recovery uh, of uh, our people and of those that supported us. Um, we, uh, we had had over a three or four days time, there had been, uh, a, a one pilot who had crashed on his first, uh, run, his strafing run, the very first one, and he had, uh, been hit they were firing down on him from the mountaintops uh, of the valley he came through. And when, uh, the, as he made his strafing run, the, uh, they, the plane rolled over and went into the mountain. And uh, they, we had a team that was just in really, really serious trouble. And uh, uh, they finally, the, the, other, the other A-1 uh, aircraft, they were able to, to, uh, to suppress the, the fire uh, on our small team. I, I don't, it was another one of our teams that was just in, in real trouble. And uh, they were about to be overrun, but they did get them out. Uh, then we began the 
search and rescue to recover the pilot possible. And uh, they put in one bright light team. Well, that was what those were the recovery teams. Uh, they put in one bright light team and they were just almost over. Uh, they were driven out of there. They rescued them to the uh, they were They were walking to the, you know, they would put them into a, a, a cleared area and they would walk up, try to get up the mountain. They could never get there. And two teams uh, were run out. And my team could, I had taught them to repel. And uh, they, they came to me and asked me if I, uh, I thought I could repel. They told me what the situation was. Asked me if I thought I could repel uh, with my team of mountain yards and my radio, my U.S. operator, U.S. Well, I always, I always say Bill, Bill Jank was my, uh, he carried the radio, he was my radio operator. And the rest of my team uh, were mountain yards. And uh, we got out there, we flew out uh, to the mountain and uh, flew over, flew into the, above the crash site. We dropped the ropes. The ropes didn't come anywhere close. You couldn't get down. The, the leaves were burned off the trees. Uh, but we couldn't get low enough to get the ropes to the ground, so we couldn't couldn't repel it. Uh, we would get there as a stretch factor, but that didn't even help. That stretch factor with the ropes. So we backed off, and while the, the back in our cubby rider, uh, look for a place that they could get us, might be able to get us into. They went to the other side of the mountain and there was, a, 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 it was the dry season and there was a, a stream that ran uh, between the mountain and uh, uh, sandbars. And so we, it was obvious we could, we could repel into those sandbars. And we did. But then we had to crawl. We had to uh, uh, get through across the river. We crossed the river. We came up the bank on the on the side of the river as it started up the mountain. And it we we looked over, and here is just a. It looks like a village. It's. But it's an NBA encampment out there, uh, and my radio operator asked me. So he said, well, "What is this?" I said, "It's a pit I carry. Keep running." This was his. And I was, this was his second time out, and Bill did a tremendous job. But he uh, he said, "What is it?" I said, "It's, it's a bivouac here. Keep running," and uh, we scrambled up the mountain. We, we, it took us a, a good part of the, day, of the day to get up. We were being chased uh, up the mountain. They were bringing more troops in. Uh, it was getting more and more difficult. We finally got up over the top of the mountain and got down into the, the actual crash site itself. So we finally made it there with the bright white team. It was just utter devastation. No trees, you know, no, no leaves on the trees. Uh, it was just devastating. Our instructions for a bright light uh, for an aircraft was that we the first of course, we would look for a body. Uh, the second thing, if, if we couldn't recover a body, then we would, uh, and, and if we were, they asked us to bring back pieces of uh, the uh, air, airplane that had been just shredded. They asked us, asked us to, to pick the uh, 
pieces small enough that we could put them in our rucksacks and, and carry it out. But if it had numbers on it, it had to have numbers. If we found those small pieces with numbers, we stuff those in our rucksacks. Uh, ours and mountain lords. Um, we did a, a search of the, the, the area and we found a uh, the charred flight helmet. Uh, the helmet was it was charred. This part of the, the helmet was what was remains. The top part was out. It had burned out. I don't know, I, I, but that's what it was. It looked like just the muck kind of thing. And we were we kept talking with the, with the, the Covey rider and with the uh, fact, and they were telling us we were going to have to hurry. He said they're coming, they're coming from all directions. And he said we've got to we've, we've got to get out of this area. Uh, so we we stuffed that stuff, everything we could find into our uh, into our rucksacks, and we started it. Uh, a race with the NVA to get down that side of the mountain down to a, a, a lowland where we could uh, make it a, a clearing, kind of a cleared area where we could, uh, they could pull us out. Uh, they could drop, we would come out on the wire rigs. And the wire rig is a, a saddle kind of a thing. and. Uh, they drop it on a rope and lift us out. Uh, we got uh, when we got down there. Uh, it was obvious that the, the ropes that we had uh, from the choir rig, those were not going to reach the ground. We wouldn't be able to get in. And if we, there were just a few trees that were tall that would impede. The, the helicopters of me. And uh, so I crawled out there and uh, I was using dead cord, uh, detonation cord and uh, C4 explosive. And depending on the size of the tree, I was using one or the other. And I, had, uh, I was cutting down trees. And all of a sudden, there was the most gosh awful uh, explosion that I, I it, it, I think it lifted me off the ground. That mountain shook, I'll swear. I, uh, I later found out, talking to Lyndon Gill, mm -hmm. uh, one of his dad's best friends, uh, talking to him, uh, he told me what had happened. That every single plane that was flyable out of Pleiku was out there that day over us, helping us. And uh, they were given permission to go in and every one of those planes. The, 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 in, the NBA had overrun us we were laying we'd hidden they walked higher up onto the mountain and when they got to the top uh lyndon gill called in that full group of airplanes and they just unloaded unfortunately they this was bill jenks first his first time out he got it. He drew a bright, a bright light the very first time, but he uh, they got him on the radio and asked him for permission to to drop to unload their ordnance on that the NVA force that it was milling around on the top of the mountain, and uh, and Bill told him, yeah, uh, and I had no idea he'd done that, and uh, it scared the dickens out of me. I, I had no idea what the explosions were, but he did. Um, we 
we took took everything back that we could. They did get us out. They pulled us out on, we called it strings and McGuire rigs. We flew back uh, and, and we turned in everything that we picked up. Uh, parts of the airplane, the helmet, and uh, several other things. And, uh, and that was it for us. You know, we prepared, went ahead, prepared for the next target. And for, four, for 40 years, for 40 years, I had it was just on my mind. I had it it was, it, you know, it's a crazy thing, but I, it was just I wanted, I always wondered if we brought back enough that they could tell that pilot, uh, that pilot's family, that pilot's family, could tell them uh, what had happened on that mountain. And uh, I went. Like I said, this was in 1968, August 1968. And just a couple of three years ago, uh, I, well, the, actually it was longer than that. It was the first year that, that Don Engelbretson brought his uh, some, some of his group out to our, our annual reunion in Las Vegas. And your annual reunion is? Uh, so it's Special Operations Association reunion. So okay. And we go out every year in October and we meet out there. And, but uh, uh, Don brought out his uh, number, his pilot, several of them. And he they gave a presentation to us about how they supported us. And Don was kind of leading the thing, and we, they had each one made their contribution each of the pilots. And I was sitting on an end row, and Don was standing out here. He was waiting. He was getting uh, cables set up and microphones so that we could ask him questions. And he while they were getting this set up, I just said, sir, uh, uh, I, could I ask you a question? And he said, well, sure. And uh, I said, I explained that I had uh, been on a bright light mission in August of 68. And that uh, I, I explained exactly what had happened. We'd had one of our teams who was about to be overrun, and the Sky Raiders came to the rescue, and uh, one went down. And, uh, and I explained that we had gone out, and what, what I had found, I told him what I had found, and what the... the and uh, I wondered, I've always, I had always wondered for 40 some years if we had brought back enough that they could tell the family uh, yeah. that it was, he mm -hmm. for sure was gone. And I finished that, I can't remember exactly how I said it to him, but he looked at me kind of funny and he said, why would a sane man do that? Why would a sane man do that? And I said, he was looking at me, he was in, in front, you know, why would I go out there knowing what he was waiting on me when I went in my team, my team. And I told him I, I, I couldn't I was just stunned and 
And I told him, I said, well, that's what we do. That's what we do. And, uh, for the people who supported us so well, we wanted to return to them as best we could. And uh, and I hoped, I hoped uh, that with some of those remnants you know, of the crash, that they could have notified the family. But Don yeah. helped you guys get together, correct? Or he started the ball he rolling. Steve Steve Moore, who wrote the book that book uh, Uncommon Valor, and Don Ingerbretson started looking uh, for. You know, I I had no idea what the name the name of the pilot was. Who it was? But they were they started researching to try to find the pilot's name in the paint. And I, that went on, I, I know it went on for over a year, as they were digging around trying to find it. And Steve Moore ran across uh, a paper uh, online a uh, paper, it, it was, uh, I, I don't know what the community was in Pennsylvania, but it was, I can't, they may have told me, but I can't remember. Uh, there was a newspaper article, someone, I, I believe it was your uh, uncle, yeah. uh, that, that was interviewed. Right. They did a, an interview, an article on my father from Pennsylvania, my dad was a Penn Stater. Okay. So they did an article on him being one of the, you know, the vet, one of the, alumni of Penn State who perished in the war. So we did some interviews with them and they put it, you know, they posted the paper. Of course, today's technology went right online and that's the first article we saw, I think. Yeah. And when I, they said, they sent me, a, some way they got a copy of that thing off, off of online and they sent it to me. Uh, over the internet. They sent it to me. And uh, I all the pieces read, fit. Yeah, all the pieces fit. And the one that got me the most, it, uh, was, I told you, read, it said that they told y'all that a team had gone in there and had gotten into the crash site and they brought out pieces of the aircraft and a chart you know, how did the two of you meet them i heard that you wound up or the family came out to sar or soar as well yeah, well that was a little way later yeah that was a little bit later what happened was you know, once they got their facts straight, Steve Moore started trying to find out the family, you know. So my sister got the phone call first of Montana from Steve Moore. And he said, hey, you know, you know, we think we have a connection here, blah, blah, blah. So my sister called me. She, you know, I don't think she could talk to Steve right away. That was a, a voicemail. So my sister called me and said, hey, this guy called. I don't know how to answer him. I said, give me the number. I'll call him back. So I called back Steve Moore, Steve, and... Uh, he started telling me the story. And I'm going, I'm putting it all together in my head. And I says, yeah, I, I think this is the guy because I have all the records of my father's incident there and, and uh, it all lined up. So we, I think we talked a couple of times. And so finally he said, would you like to talk to George Wilson? And I said, if he's willing to talk, I'm willing to, I'll give him a call. You know, because I don't know, you know, with the Vietnam vets, I'm really not too sure. Some don't want to talk, some do, and so uh, if he's want to talk, I'd love to talk to him. Uh, so I called him, and uh, I don't know if I got you the first time, but I think I got you the second time. And we had a real nice conversation on the phone, and it was just something. I was dumbfounded by his story. I just was dumbfounded. 
because it was pretty obvious to me my father did not survive. Even at a young age, I was pretty, pretty I knew he didn't survive. But to hear his story and to know that he was there, that was real emotional to know that he was the closest to where my dad had perished. And he had done what he did. It was simply amazing. Just blew me away. So we had a nice conversation on the phone. And then, uh, maybe a year later, even, maybe even less than that, they invited us, my, the family, to the SOAR. Uh, the SOAR. So I, I said, all right. So my, me and my wife went out there, and my sister, two sisters came. My brother couldn't come, and I had my nieces there as well. They were waiting for us at the front door. We had a nice conversation. We had a beautiful weekend with these folks, a week with these folks. It was nice. But we sat down, we compared notes, and we talked, and uh, a lot of closure. You know, it was a lot of closure. It was nice, uh, I think, on both sides. Uh, yes. You know, it's a sad story, obviously, but uh, it's a story nonetheless. And uh, it was just it was just nice to be able to talk to George and get all that. How often have you run into each other? And it was a surprise to hear you were here today. It was, because... I didn't know he was coming. And I saw this, you know, I followed the Tennessee Museum on Facebook and I saw they're having the A1 guys come here. And they, I knew I always wanted to come up here. I knew this was a special place. And I said, well, I need to get up there. I need to get up there. So I, I saw on Facebook, they had the A1 guys coming. They're going to have the two A1s here. And I said, man, I should go. You know, it's an eight hour drive from Florida. I live down the pan. And I said, eh. And my wife says, why don't you go? Why don't you go? And I said, yeah, what the heck? So I drove up yesterday, not knowing he was going to be here, not knowing what to expect, I, you know. I, saw, I knew Don would probably be here. But I really wanted to see day once. I, mean, I really wanted to see Don. I'm the closest person I've seen fly. And so I come up here, and, you know, I got here just as they took off. I'm out there, you know, watching like everybody else. And you and me looked at each other out there, and it just wasn't, it wasn't clicking, or it was clicking, and we weren't too sure. <laughs> That's right. I, I, I said, that, that, that sure looks like day, day wolf <laughs> And it just, all of a sudden, we walked in here and Don said, well, George is here. I said, that was George out there. Why didn't I go over? <laughs> and sure enough, it was George and we got together again. So that's the first time we've seen each other since the SOAR. I think that was three, maybe four years ago that we were at the SOAR together. So, yeah, it was good to see him again. But out of something bad, you guys have probably got a very unique bond. We you do. Say? And I was I, telling him earlier, it's, it, he's family now. He's part of it because, he, you know sacrifice he made in the ordeal he went to and uh, he was there he was there and uh there's a connection he can't be broken and he has family now i i text as soon as i i text all my sisters and my brother i said guess who i ran into and of course they all right buy him a beer buy him a beer <laughs> <laughs> they're thrilled to death so yeah it was good it was a good get together it was nice great gentlemen i want to thank you both for taking the time to sit down and, and letting us document this. We really, really appreciate it. No I don't know where we'll put it. That's all right. But That's what we right. do, we're, we're gathering all this information for someday to be able to put something together with the museum because we have found the bonds of family, friends, and brothers that just keep connecting right here. It, it's right. amazing. So, yeah. it's good. Well, thank you very much. I want to say thank you. Sandy one. Okay, where am I from you now? Where am I from you now? Say again, say again. Okay, I want you to go back with three and four. Go back with three and four. We'll call you to execute as soon as we find Bravo. Okay, we're going to drive with three and four. Alamo three, two, seven. Eight, two, seven, two Bravo, Sandy one. How do you read now? You have in sight? Have me in sight? Okay, I'm going to fly down the river, down the river. Tell me when I'm over your location, over your location. A little bit longer until uh, Alamo 2 gets in a little bit of shape.